Hello and welcome to Mr C History. I am at Bletchley, Bletchley House just outside Milton Keynes. This during World War II was the amazing secret clandestine hub network of allied code breaking. Yes, this is the place where the Nazi codes were cracked. An amazing team were working in secret to win the war as quickly as they could. They were some of the most brilliant minds in the land and they orchestrated the start of the computer age. So join me as I have a little look round to see the legacy and impact of this amazing place. So what is Bletchley and why here? Why set up this secret code breaking centre here? Well it is an old stately home that looks like this and it still exists very well. Uh, this all very very nice and in the late 1930s this house was put up for sale by the Leon family, this old family, and it wasn't very well known. And then a man called Hugh Sinclair, who was the head of the security service, the MI6, he heard about this place and he organised a secret sort of recce over here called the Captain Ridley's Shooting Party, where he would come along and have a little inspection and he found out that this was a perfect place to set up secret operations. Now, significant about this, this was before the Second World War. This was the late 1930s, about 1938. That, you know, World War II had not yet begun, so the foresight to set it up here is quite significant. Why is this a good place? Well, we're far away from London, so we can keep secret and crucially we're safe from any bombing, but we're not too far away and we're very close to the main line train, so you could get in and out pretty well. You're also very close by train to Oxford and Cambridge, so you can get a lot of clever people to come over here and work for you. So, when war breaks out, if this place is ready. Hugh Sinclair has got all his clever clogs here. He's assemb assembled a crack team ready to go. This is significant because one criticism people have of Britain before World War II, it wasn't well prepared, it wasn't ready for the Nazi threat, armaments, etc. Except for intelligence and code breaking, it was definitely ready. Bletchley Park was the place to crack codes. You can come and visit Bletchley nowadays and it still retains its stately home vibe. They still have the original Hugh Sinclair office bits where they know where the original work before the war took place in the offices with all the typewriters etc. They soon realised however that they needed to expand so they built extra buildings including lots of huts, these sort of tin roof buildings. And you can go inside, there's still a sort of 1940s vibe to it all with the uh, furniture and again the typewriters where, and the offices where all this hard work was put in by so many people, relentless hours cracking codes and trying to decipher things. And this is the main control room where they would decide on in the morning what the best and the key codes that need to be broke. For example, something about the, ne the Netherlands there on the wall. And this is Alan Turing's office, which was famously always quite messy. And actually what you can still see there is his coffee cup or his tea cup, which he chained to the radiator so that nobody would steal it. Now my time at Bletchley Park was quite limited and quite rushed and I didn't quite get to grips with the work that they were doing there at Bletchley. It was so much mathematical logic that someone like me, I just absolutely couldn't make head nor tail of it. So I've come now here to the end of the runway at Croydon Airfield to explain a bit of actually what they were doing at Bletchley. So the Germans were sending messages around the areas they had occupied. So for example, they were sending messages to the tank commanders in North Africa about where to take their tanks. They were sending messages to the U-boats in the Atlantic to see which boats to take on. And they were sending messages to the Luftwaffe, their air force, to say perhaps you should go and bomb British airfields like here at Croydon. But these messages weren't in just plain old normal language. They were, of course, in code. They were encrypted so that the Allies couldn't read them very easily. But the Allies did really want to know what was in these messages so they could intercept them and stop those U-boats from sinking all the ships, etc. So the race was on to try and decrypt these messages. 
Now, these messages were written in a code, as I said, known as the Enigma code. There were other codes. There was one, the Lorenz code, which was even more complex than Enigma, and that was the code that Hitler used to communicate with his field marshals. But the famous one is the Enigma code. And this code was, writ was written on a machine known as the Enigma machine, which essentially is a typewriter, but a very complex typewriter, because behind every key was a set of sort of wires that rotated to create the code. So, for example, if you typed the letter A on the typewriter, it wouldn't create the letter A. The things at the back, the wires at the back would rotate and create a random letter like Q. But then if you try, it was really even more complex, then if you typed an A again, it wouldn't create an A or a Q again. It might create a P or an L or an R or something like that. Totally random, all the keys on the keyboard. So as you can imagine, the combinations were in their billions of potential to what types of things they be. So these messages were in total gobbledygook, all these different letters. It was so, so hard to decrypt them. It's obviously more complicated because these messages are probably almost certainly in German. They might also be in Italian. They were trying to intercept the Italians as well. And even in Japanese. And, you know, believe me, in rural Oxfordshire in the 1940s, there were not many native Japanese speakers. The other thing that made it really complicated is that every 24 hours at midnight, the settings on the Enigma machine were reset by the Germans. So if, they, if anyone was getting close to trying to decrypt it, it's all gone after a day, you have to start again. So how did they do it? How did they eventually decrypt at Bletchley? Well, it's a bit of a mixture of sort of guesswork and a bit of luck and amazing ingenuity and engineering. The engineering side of it is they created these machines, essentially computers, early style of computers that processing various things. And it was, they made one that was called the bomb or the bomber, bomb with an E on the end. That was an Alan Turing's team, which was pretty large, this big, large box inside of it, which were many different cylinders. Each one essentially a little Enigma machine with lots of wires rotating all the letters. It could quickly go through as many of those combinations like I've just discussed. So they need a bit of a hint. They need to guess or they need what is known as a crib, a sort of thing to try and test out. So in order to test that, they knew every morning that the Germans were going to send out a weather report. So they therefore right, thought, OK, they're going to definitely do that. Let's search the German word for weather, Wetter, W-E-T-T-E-R. Put that into the bomber machine to try and find out those letters. It will turn the few out. Oh, looks like we've got the, what the W is, what the E might be, what the TT, and then we can figure it out from there. And it worked. And an engineer could take that and put that on an Enigma machine that they had stolen from the Germans, type in, hey presto, they cracked the code. The problem is, of course, as I said, it changes every day. So every single day they had to go through that process, which is why thousands of people worked throughout the war at Bletchley through this arduous, relentless, but incredibly significant work. Another significant thing about Bletchley, of course, is the role played by women. From the about 10,000 people or so who worked here, 75% were women, because many of the men were obviously fighting elsewhere or coal mining or something like that. And these women were extraordinary and showed unbelievable bravery and resilience. Some very significant ones, Joan Clark, who was in Alan Turing's team. She was a brilliant cryptographer and were fresh from Oxford, incredible intellect. And there was another team called the Dillies Phillies, who was led by Dilly Knox, and they were in charge of deciphering the Italian language stuff, many of the moves of what's going on in the Italian campaign. And these were women who were, you know, they were neglected by society, they were not treated well, and of, after the war as well, similarly, and they kept it all secret. So incredible dedication from many, many significant women. <laughs> Winston Churchill said something significant about the people who worked, especially the women. He said, they were the geese that laid the golden egg and never cackled. And what he means by that is the golden egg is the significance of it all. They are the ones who helped to end the war so quickly. And the never cackled bit is they didn't tell a soul. They were sworn to secret. It wasn't until the 1970s which where all this came out. And many of these people, they even died never telling anybody they cracked the code or never te telling anyone they learnt Japanese or German or anything like that.
Behind me is the Colonnade Hotel in Maida Vale. And in 1912, one of the key individuals most closely associated with Bletchley Park, Alan Turing, was born there. Now he was a brilliant mathematician, straight out of Cambridge University, m amazing puzzle creator and solver. He was already also starting to develop these machines to create logic and to break codes. So sure enough, just after the war breaks out, he is recruited by Bletchley Park. And he is part of the team, indeed he leads the team, that creates the bomb machine or the bomber machine, one of the vital, vital machines that cracks the code. It is down to him that the team is able to break the German codes. Now, of course, after World War II, however, it was all secret, all embargoed, so nobody knew of his great achievements and success. And indeed, in 1952, he was arrested. What was his crime? for just being a homosexual. Homosexuality was illegal in Britain at the time and he was arrested and he was given an awful choice. Either face imprisonment or chemical castration, taking a pill which sort of reduces your libido, sex drive, etc. He chose the latter but unfortunately clearly this is a, was a really brutal and horrible decision for him and two years later in 1954 he takes his own life. A horrendous uh, tragedy here for somebody who achieved so much. Of course, by the 1970s and 1980s, it all starts to come out, the great achievements at Bletchley, and he is obviously at the forefront there. But it, it's not until 2013 that he gets a full royal pardon, uh, so he never committed the crime now. And indeed, in 2019, he's now on the, on the £50 banknote, fully celebrated as he should be. So maybe a little bit of justice and redemption, but still not enough for an incredible achievement. Let's talk legacy and significance of this place, both long-term and short-term. Well, it's obvious the short-term significance, they won the war. People reckon, it's hard to estimate, of course, but people say they shortened the war by about two years, the things they found out here. You know, they found out about where the U-boats, the Nazi U-boats were, so that they could easily go around the Allied ships and the, go around the U-boats or avoid them, meaning that the Battle of the Atlantic was essentially won. Many of the North African campaign, we knew the Nazi maneuvers, we knew where their tanks were going, etc., and pushed that forward all the way there. Fantastic. In terms of long-term significance, well, obviously it was all kept secret, many of the work here, but what was not kept secret was the technology, the, essentially the creation of these supercomputers that came about, heralded in this computer age, pushing forward aircraft travel, uh, more information, etc. Did the modern world begin here in Bletchley, this modern world where the computer reigns supreme? Maybe. All done, of course, by these amazing, significant women. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I have. This is a fantastic place to come and have a look and see what that impact and legacy is. As always, please don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you on the next one.